this out of the way. Right, so uh, first of all, I should uh, probably write down my name somewhere. So my name is Chris. And well, if you really want to know my last name, it's, it's not pronounceable, so don't use it. <laughs> so. OK, so I'm going to uh, talk about uh, how we're going to detect gravitational waves and what we're going to learn from them. And what we're going to learn from, from them, that's going to depend on how well we will be able to extract information once the detection has been made. Uh, both are formidable problems. I'll hope to convince you of that. I'll, I also hope to convince you of the fact that these problems have a solution and that we are far advanced in finding the appropriate solutions. Now, uh, this is going to be a very introductory, the first lecture at least, is going to be a very uh, introductory le lecture, is going to be an overview. It will contain things that you've seen in previous lectures and some stuff that no doubt will be new. And so, uh, I apologize beforehand for some repetition that there will probably be. So, first of all, uh, I like to have a pointer actually, uh, just a stick or something like that. Or if there is a laser pointer, that's perfect. Oh, that's, that's not necessary. Just a pointer is, uh, that'll be fine, I think. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, what you probably already have seen before is a picture of this nature with the different detectors that uh, we already had as facilities or that uh, are under construction. Again, repetition probably uh, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, I mean, that, that'll probably help. So there's the two uh, LIGO detectors um, in the United States, uh, which are four by four kilometer interferomet uh, interferometers. And um, so those have been in existence, you know, for quite some time uh, as facilities and with the interferometers on the inside in the so-called initial configuration. Um, and then the, uh, something similar goes for the Virgo detector in Italy, which is three by three kilometers. Um, then you have the smaller uh, Geo 600 uh, interferometer, um, which um, may not make a detection ever even, but the research, research and development that came from, from this smaller detector was extremely important in the construction of the, the larger detectors that will probably be the, the detection machines in the end. Um, so, uh, and, and moreover, right now, uh, Geo 600 is the only interferometer that is running. It is in so-called uh, AstroWatch mode. So if there's a supernova in our galaxy, then Geo 600 may actually make a detection and the others will see nothing because, you know, they're, they're undergoing an upgrade. <coughs> so then apart from that, there is in, in Japan, this large underground uh, facility that is uh, currently under construction, even as, as a facility still, that is the, the Kagura interferometer, also three by three kilometers, and the eventual plan is to make it cryogenic so that you uh, get uh, rid of, of, or to some extent get rid of the, the thermal noise that uh, uh, plagues us, among a whole set of other noise sources that, that you probably have heard before in uh, Peter Salsa's lectures. Um, and, of course, there uh, is uh, the plan for, Li for LIGO, Indi uh, LIGO India, um, which will be a bit later on and which may actually not be part of the uh, you know, initial detection process. But you know, like I said, there's two things. There's detection. We want to have a detection as soon as possible. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But once there are detections, we will be in a new era. We will, we will be in, in an era of gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, we will be in an era where you can do new kinds of uh, fundamental physics with gravitational waves and so on. And uh, the more detectors you have, we'll see, the better it is. You, you need a network you know, that is as large as possible. And uh, there's no doubt that LIGO India will play a key role. Um, okay, so that is the collection of detectors. And then, um, as I said, uh, so far we've only had the, uh, the initial detectors uh, operational. Uh, those were initial LIGO and initial Virgo. They've been ac active for a period of almost a dec decade, although not continuously. Uh, the accumulated joint data from the, de from the two detectors is actually only in the order of a year. Um, but uh, there has been a, an extremely lengthy process of gradual upgrades 
uh, interlaced with actual science runs where people try to detect things and then uh, you know further at, um, hardware upgrades again. It's been an extremely lengthy process, which again Peter Salson probably also talked about already before. <coughs> but the main point is that people got there. People got to design sensitivity. And even though there were no detections, actually this was already sort of anticipated. Um, although I'm, I'm not quoting it here, uh, in the um, conceptual design or in the design study of LIGO, it already says, although not necessarily with, 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 with so many words, that there was going to be an initial phase that probably would not yield detections, but would be the proof of uh, principle of the technology, namely the proof that large-scale interferometry is probably, you know, uh, well, as far as we can see, the most promising way of uh, uh, directly detecting gravitational waves. And that, that was really the point, um, and that point has now been reached. Um, but now we want, obviously, to go on to detections, um, and so now the advanced detectors are under construction. Um, so uh, that means, in particular, that uh, in the case of LIGO and Virgo, the, um, er, the original interferometers that were there were completely taken apart, They're, so they were completely removed. Uh, but the same facilities, the same tubes are, are still being used, and the same buildings and so on. Um, but now, a technologic, you know, technologically superior kind of interferometer, in each case, uh, will be or is in the process of being installed, actually. And already in 2015, there will be a first science run. Starting September 2015, there will be, for, for a period of three months, there will be an actual science run, um, not at full sensitivity, uh, and uh, it will only involve the two advanced LIGOs. Um, but then in uh, the next year, uh, advanced LIGO will probably be joined by advanced Virgo. Uh, and then over, th so that will be the second uh, science run. Uh, it will be about six months in the year 2016, 2017. And then towards 2018, uh, Kagra hopefully can join. Towards 2019, we hope to get design sensitivity. And then a bit later on, LIGO India uh, will join. Now, um, in terms of, well, how sensitive a detector is, we hear numbers of 10 to the minus 22. These are fantastic accuracies, of course. Um, but a good figure of merit of, you know, how much that means in terms of astrophysics is by looking at how far away you can see particular systems, uh, in particular, uh, binary neutron star coalescences. Because binary neutron star coalescences they're always, they, they will always be very similar to each other because it's generally believed that the masses of neutron stars in binaries fall in a pretty narrow range. Um, and so these, these are sort of like standard systems that you can use of merit to see how good a detector is, 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 is going to be. And I, I say this in a hand-waving way because probably from earlier lectures you know that if you see a system face on, if it's spiraling like that and you're, and, you know, you're, you're looking there, uh, then you see twice as much radiation as when, when it is edge on. So, you know, you could, but you can average out over angles and then determine how far away you can see stuff of, of this particular kind. And then so, um, this uh, picture here, um, first of all, the, the tiny little specks are not stars, they are, they are galaxies, and you see them being clustered into, well, clusters of, of galaxies, each of which could potentially be the host of an in-spiral event that uh, we, we can hope to see. And the orange ball in the middle is uh, basically the volume coverage of the initial LIGO detector and up to a factor of a few, also the volume coverage that the initial Virgo detector had. And so in the upgrade to the advanced detectors, um, we will be able to see approximately a factor of 10 further, and that means a volume, of, a volume coverage of a factor of 1,000 more. Um, and then uh, there, there are various astrophysical estimates um, about how many sources we will, we will see at design sensitivity. Um, and then, so, the, well, the, the standard system depicted here is neutron star, neutron star coalescence, but you can also look at neutron star black hole or black hole, black hole. Then you can look at which network, the initial detector network or an advanced detector network around 2019. And then <coughs> these uh, columns here are different estimates for the number of detections that will be, will be made per year for these different kind of systems and different detector networks. And there's huge uncertainty. I mean, there's uh, several orders of magnitude difference between the low estimate, call it pessimistic, and the high estimate, call that optimistic. 
and then something in between, which in very fat quotation marks we, we call realistic, but you know, you need something to hang on to. Um, now, um, in the for the initial detector era, you see that all of these numbers are very small. We would have to uh, have the, the high rate to see 0 0.2 uh, binary neutron star coalescences per year. And so it is no surprise that in the with the initial detectors, nothing was seen. And this changes dramatically when we go to the advanced detector era, where even the, the pessimistic numbers, this zero, 0 0.4 here, means that you would have to, mate, have to wait approximately, well, two or three years uh, to see a binary neutron star uh, detection. That would not, not be a happy situation, but uh, okay, it's not dramatic either. And then the, the well, the, the, the scenario we hope for is, is, of course, to see tens of uh, sources per year. Um, so yes, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, but, um, uh, and also these numbers are actually pertaining to what the detectors will be able to do at the science sensitivity, so towards uh, 2019, but with, with, with so, many, uh, so much uncertainty, of course, a detection could be made at any point starting from 2015. That is, you know, at any point starting from the moment that the advanced detectors start doing science, uh, science runs. Uh, the, well, these are optimistic numbers for sure. Um, the, these, are, these plausible numbers happen to actually roughly correspond to the following, uh, following scenario. So we, we know there are gamma ray, these short hard gamma ray bursts, right? Uh, and uh, we know that they're fairly strongly beamed. Now, what is not known precisely is, is, is what the beaming angle is, but we know approximately at least what, what a typical beaming angle could be, um, like 10 degrees, let's say, uh, for instance. Then, um, well, there, since because of the strong beaming of the gamma rays, at least, there are a lot of GRBs that, we are, that the dedicated GRB probes are missing. You know? But um, based on, on that, you can calculate how many GRBs go off per, per volume in space, per cubic megaparsec, let's say. Then you can you know, think of the volume of space we will actually have access to. And that also gives you uh, an estimate of how many GRBs, or rather, how many binary neutron, neutron star coalescences you might see. And in our case, the radiation is almost isotropic. Like I said, there's only a factor of two difference between gravitational radiation in the in-spiral plane and radiation uh, perpendicular to the in-spiral plane. So you know, if, you, if you run the numbers, then you do end up well, not, not exactly 40, of course, but you do end up with maybe 10 to a few tens of uh, detections per year that we should have at design sensitivity. This is including the sort of the the uh, opening angle of the GRB? Well, no. The, so if, if, if the, 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 best, the best scenario would be if the, the true opening angles are very, very narrow, because that means that almost all GRBs are missed by the GRB probes. But we will see, you know, Again, we will see everything that is within our uh, horizon. But no, there, there are uncertainties on these opening angles. And, and so then that, those numbers can reduce to one a year. Or you know, that, that is certainly the case. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to know how do you differentiate between a binary neutron star and a neutron star black hole from the looking at the GRB populations? I mean, uh, say it's a Oh, we do, we, I, those, the short answer is we don't. So, so you know, the, the, so the, the number I, I, so the numbers I quoted based on these GRB uh, opening angle calculations, you know, just assume that all GRBs are binary neutron stars, which is probably not the case. Um, but in any case, you know, these are back of the envelope calculations where high precision is uh, not possible anyway. Oh, no, 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 this is not only from GRBs. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, the, the, the GRBs give us some hope okay. that the, the middle column is approximately right. But, the, but what goes into the middle column is a lot more stellar okay. evolution models okay. and, and so on, yeah. yeah. How do we get the number for the binary? That is entirely actually stellar evolution models, um, you know, because obviously nobody has even, you know, in the, in, the, in the case of binary black holes, you cannot even extrapolate from the number of binaries you see in our galaxy because none have been seen in that case. So you, in the case of binary neutron stars, you can at least extrapolate from uh, the number of binary neutron stars that are actually seen in our, our, our galaxy and then hope that our galaxy is typical. Oh yeah. 
So why are there three numbers? Right? If it's a theoretical number, that can be small. Oh, because that is how much uncertainty uh, there is in these uh, synthesis models. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Blame him. <laughs> Okay, so um, now, I'm, I'm, in these lectures, I'm mostly going to talk about the kind of uh, interferometers we will have, uh, you know, in the next several years and then uh, into the, the next decade. But I also will occasionally refer to the far future because, you know, we're, we're physicists or astrophysicists and we always want uh, bigger machines, right? Bigger, bigger, bigger. Um, and bigger is better, usually. So um, one idea is to... Well, make interferometers larger, put them underground so that you have, uh, far less, uh, you're far less bothered by seismic disturbances uh, like uh, you know, trucks coming by or planes flying over and so on. Also, um, it's a pity you can't see this very well, it's a bit dark, but also we want very long mirror suspensions, again for uh, added stability. Um, we want high laser power, at the same time we want cryogenic interferometers. Uh, in this particular idea called Einstein telescope, you would have a triangle configuration of interferometers. So one interferometer is like this, the second one like that, and the third one like that. Um, the idea being that if you have uh, multiple interferometers, also with a network of second generation uh, interferometers, some, one thing you buy from having multiple interferometers is better ability to distinguish the two polarizations of the gravitational wave, and then hopefully extract more science that way. Um, in this case, the three interferometers are co-located, they're in the same place, so what you don't gain in this way is uh, resolution on the sky, which probably was also talked, talked about in, uh, in a previous lecture. Uh, but uh, in, fact, in fact, I'll come to that uh, again as well. So, uh, it's meant to be, yeah, so in the most recent incarnation, it is actually six interferometers. So the, the idea is that uh, uh, you have um, three that are uh, cryogenic, and three that are non-cryogenic, so that you cover two different frequency ranges which you, you can stitch together. Yeah. Okay, so the frequency range is between a few hertz to several kilohertz, which is approximately the same frequency range as for the, the second generation detectors. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, well, and, but there are, so the, the frequency range is actually uh, larger in both directions and this, this will buy you physics. For instance, um, the so the lowest frequency where you can still see something, in the case of Einstein telescope, that'll be a couple of hertz. In the case of second generation detectors, it'll be maybe 20 hertz, uh, probably a, li a little bit higher. And that makes a huge difference because very massive coalescing systems, um, they will coalesce you know, at very low frequencies. And so you, you, you then have the hope of actually seeing more of those systems or seeing them in the first place. So that is, that is one advantage. Uh, another, so, and then at the, at the other frequency end, you can go to much higher frequencies as well with this Einstein telescope. And their advantages include things like um, the, uh, being able to see very clearly the merger of two neutron stars, which contains an enormous amount of, of physics, like Cole, I think, will explain in, in his lectures in, in the course uh, of the week. So, what you gain is not only, well, so one thing you gain is a factor of two of sensitivity over and above the second generation detectors, allowing you another gain of a factor of a thousand uh, in volume coverage, and therefore many, many, many more sources. But you also gain more directly in terms of physics by having, you know, being able to see the very low frequencies and by being able to see the very high frequencies, for sure, yeah. Ah, yeah. So, uh, for um, the so the, 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 there is a tension between wanting to get rid of thermal noise and wanting to have high laser power. Okay. So, um, if you want to get rid of thermal noise, then you need to cool your mirrors. But that means your laser power has to be lower. That is a different frequency regime from the other way around. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So this Einstein telescope will be ground-based detector. This will be a ground-based yeah, detector. And the arm will be it will be, yes, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. 
Yeah, if you, if, you, if you wanted to build these things above ground, uh, and in fact three of them probably will be built above ground, that's true, you have to take the curvature of the earth uh, uh, into account, but um, that's not so bad. You, could, you can dig a groove basically, right? So, so that where the two arms meet, you are at a depth of, I don't know how much it would be, probably 10, <laughs> order 10 meter or maybe a few tens of meters if needs be. That's, that's, that's okay, that, that is feasible. Oh no, that, that won't be a problem, right? Because uh, you, you, you do need to, well, it won't be a problem. You, you do need to make sure that your vacuum, tu the vacuum tubes are straight. And that is why you dig, in the even in the case where the detectors are quote unquote above ground. So basically, if you, uh, so you have the, the curvature of the Earth, and let's say I'm, I'm going to draw uh, one, one arm of an interferometer, then, well, it's going to go like this. No, so, 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 oh, yeah. Freely suspend the mirrors. Yeah. They won't be exactly parallel. Ah, that is what you mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, you, that, that's something you would have to correct for as well, indeed. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But, but, but I think that will be okay, because as long as the, the mirrors are stationary, it doesn't matter that they're a bit closer to each other than, you know, one would have hoped. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. So you, you mean that they, they will actually be tilted with respect to each other as well, I, yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. So, okay, in, in, um, so in the case of uh, Einstein telescope, you will be able to see uh, uh, binary coalescences out to, well, here you see uh, the, the, mass, the mass range from uh, one solar mass to, well, uh, uh, tens of thousands of solar masses. Here you see the redshift. <coughs> up to a redshift of 17, however, for systems that are rather heavy that we may not see so often. And here you have the same thing in uh, so-called luminosity distance. And the reason why there are these several <coughs> curves, well, actually, let me only explain the reason why there's two colors and the rest are, are details that you, know, you can ask me about later. But uh, basically, if you see systems out to large redshifts, then the, the observed masses also get redshifted. So as a system with a total mass, intrinsic total mass of m, if you see it at a redshift of z, then actually the signal will appear to be coming from a binary that has a mass m times 1 plus z. So therefore a, a larger mass than what is actually the intrinsic mass. And so that is what the red and the blue is for. The, the red gives you the distance reach for the intrinsic masses, and the blue gives you uh, the distance reach for the same objects, but you know, in terms of the, in terms of, um, uh, the redshifted masses. OK, so, uh, but then you know, uh, I already mentioned, uh, uh, in response to this good question there, actually, that you know, not only will our physics capabilities improve by having better low frequency sensitivity and better high frequency se sensitivity both. But then the fact that you have um, uh, a factor of 10 uh, more sensitivity, factor of 1,000 more volume you can see through these huge distances, um, you will also have many, many more systems or many, many more uh, detections. So here we have the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the event rate in ET for binary neutron stars. Again, the same uncertainties apply, of course, but it will be between 1,000 and maybe 10 million per year and then uh, for NSBH, um, similar numbers. And this is actually also important for a variety of reasons. Um, I'll, I'll actually come to it, but basically, one thing we, we learned from this uh, course is that you know, even if you only had um, sources with very low signal-to-noise ratio, that is very weak sources, but you had a lot of them, then you would be able to combine information from all of those sources to arrive at a much stronger result for whatever, to address whatever, almost whatever science question you wish, you wish to ask. So that is one, one advantage you will have from the sheer numbers. And another advantage, together with uh, this huge red, redshift reach that you'll have, another advantage is that you'll actually be able to use these coalescences as kind of cosmic distance markers to uh, you know, study the, the uh, large scale evolution uh, of the universe in terms of uh, curvature evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, th there are a number of ways in which you can actually extra extract the redshift intrinsically from say. So there's there's several things you can do, right? So so the uh, simplest thing you can hope for is that uh, you make a detection, 
and uh, you know approximately from what patch of the sky uh, the, uh, the signal came from, assume that there are multiple locations where they built an Einstein telescope so you can triangulate, right? Um, then you can hope to identify the host galaxy. If you have the host galaxy, then you also have, then you have the redshift. Now, you know, at redshifts of this large, that's going to be, in many cases, extremely difficult. So you shouldn't, in most cases, hope for it. But there are other ways. For instance, in the case of binary neutron stars, there are, at near the end of the in-spiral process, the two neutron star stars start deforming each other because of the tidal effects they exert uh, on each other. And so the uh, part of the waveform that encodes this tidal effect um, goes like the deformability, which has dimensions mass to the fifth, we'll get to that, to that by the way, the deformability, which has dimensions mass to the fifth, divided by mass to the fifth. In other words, the tidal effect, the way it is encoded in uh, the gravitational waveform, doesn't get redshifted. So if you can somehow isolate that part of the signal, which will be difficult, by the way, even in the case of ET, but if you can do that, then you can actually get the redshift from the signal, from the gravitational wave signal itself. So, but in that case of tidal effect, it shows the difference on the equation of state. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 that's, that's exactly right, yes. So what, so what you should do in the case of Einstein telescope is then use at least part of your uh, binary neutron star detections to first measure the neutron star equation of state. That is, that is exactly right. And to what precision it needs to be measured so that you can sort of compare it with planned level precision of cosmology. So my, uh, to replace the question, to what, what constant you need on the radius of the neutron star? Mm -hmm. So it's a half a kilometer or even less to get a Planck level precision. Uh, Planck level? Planck level precision in cosmology. Like oh, as in, the, as, in the Planck, the as in the Planck probe. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, okay, so, so it, 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 should, it should actually be compared with uh, what one does with, uh, with uh, type 1a supernovae as, as cosmic markers. But I'm actually going to get to, uh, get to that uh, discussion. So if you ask your question again then, but because I will have forgotten it by then. <laughs> but very good question again. Good. Oh yeah, yeah. So okay. So um, so first of all, um, uh, why does it rise? Well, um, so imagine that you know we wouldn't be uh, plotting how far you can see, but rather how strong the signal is for a given distance. So at low masses, the the signal intrinsically is rather weak. If you crank up the mass, you get more gravitational waves. So. Uh, if we turn this around and, you know, look at particular uh, and, and vary the masses, then you should see the distance rise because you can see to larger and larger distances. But then eventually it will have to go down again. Why? Because also as you increase the mass, you actually, or the part of the signal that is in band will actually get shorter. The place where the signal cuts off, the frequency at which the, fre uh, the signal cuts off, approximately goes like one upon the total mass. So as the total mass gets larger, the termination frequency gets lower and lower, and eventually it's totally out of band because it's too, too low frequency. And that is the, the descent here that, that you see. Okay, um, right, so this, this is Einstein telescope. And then, uh, Something that um, is uh, also getting extremely concrete now is uh, LISA or ELISA. <coughs> so LISA stands for Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. E stands for Evolved LISA. It should actually be D-LISA for D-scope LISA for lack of money, but okay. <laughs> but it, you know, even the D-scoped version will be such a, a fantastic instrument that we will all be very happy if that is the thing that goes up instead of the, the full uh, LISA. But in any, way, in any case, the, the full LISA configuration was to consist of three spacecraft at a separation of uh, five million kilometers, all three in orbit around the sun, but in orbits with a different inclination with, res with respect to the ecliptic. The ecliptic plane is which most of the, the planets more or less move, right? So you have three orbits with different inclinations with respect to it, the ecliptic. And if you arrange things cleverly, then you can uh, make it so that the three probes, as they orbit the sun, they retain a triangle configuration without you having to do anything. You don't have to switch on rocket engines all the time. Just Newtonian gravity will give you a rotating uh, triangle that goes around the sun. Um, and they exchange laser beams, and so you have interferometry again, right? 
So you have these three probes uh, in orbit around the sun, uh, chosen so that uh, the triangle configuration is uh, re uh, retained, and you have interferometry. Now, uh, a rule of thumb in physics is um, if you're looking for waves, then um, you know, the size of your instrument determines the, the kind of wavelengths you will be sensitive to. Now, for uh, detectors on the Earth, well, the detectors on the Earth have arms in the orders of kilometers, so the, the, they will well, be sensitive to relatively, relatively short wavelengths and therefore higher frequencies, as we've seen frequencies uh, between, let's say, a few hertz and a few tens of uh, kilohertz. But if you have a huge instrument, then uh, you're more sensitive to the long wavelengths, and the long wavelengths, they come from and low frequencies, therefore, and they come from different kinds of sources. And so uh, one source that has, has very long wavelengths, uh, those are white dwarf binaries that, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a, well, a whole bunch of them known to exist in the galaxy. And uh, these are very wide binaries that are nowhere near coalescence. In fact, for all practical purposes, the, you know, their, their, their orbits are shrinking so slowly that actually you know, the gravitational wave signal, uh, signal coming from them, for all intents and, and purposes, it is monochromatic. Um, but uh, so what, what sets the frequency or the wavelength is the size of the system as a whole. The two white dwarfs are, are still far apart from each other. And so uh, those are, uh, that, that is one kind of system that we will be able to see with a space-based detector. Um, then uh, another uh, kind of system which is uh, rather exciting from a fundamental, fundamental physics point of view, although I'll get to that, uh, is um, a supermassive black hole, let's say, or a very massive black hole in any case, with a lighter stellar mass object in orbit around it, like a neutron star or a stellar mass black hole, um, then uh, typically the, the orbit will, will not be circular. It, it will, in fact, uh, uh, you know, make this extremely complicated dance, and in doing so, uh, you know, it will be mapping out the geometry in the vicinity of that very massive object that is uh, in the center, the geometry of space-time around that uh, massive black hole that is in the center. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and, well, the way you do the mapping is by looking at the very complicated gravitational wave signal you see from uh, these sources. And that would be a test of the so-called Nohair theorem, but I will, I will get to that later on uh, in the course. And then uh, what will certainly be a, a prime source for uh, LISA or ELISA is binary supermassive black holes. So it is uh, known or at least strongly believed by now that almost all galaxies have an extremely massive uh, black, holes, black hole in their center uh, with a mass of uh, uh, between 100,000 and, and more than a billion uh, solar masses. And some galaxies, because of a merger of two, two galaxies maybe, will actually have two supermassive black holes. Uh, and that because of a merger of galaxies, uh, you now have one galaxy that contains two supermassive black holes that will have eventually will sink towards the center enter into a binary and undergo a coalescence this time. So not like the, like, like the white dwarf. And uh, so then you see a compact binary coalescence uh, again, uh, except it occurs at very uh, low frequencies because of the size of the black holes. Um, and incidentally, this is a composite uh, picture uh, but it is a real image that astronomers have made where you see what is likely to be a binary supermassive black hole. And the two blobs you see are, of course, not the black holes themselves because they don't emit any electromagnetic radiation. But what you see is um, the effect of accretion disks around each of the two, uh, of each of the two black holes. So, uh, so now we've talked about the detectors and, uh, well, uh, so far, yeah. Um, at the, yeah, at uh, the higher frequencies, you, you're going to lose sensitivity because of the fact that your detector is no longer tuned for, you know, the, the low freq or the, the, rather the, the lower wavelength gravitational waves. And then there are other effects uh, that come into play, like you have to uh, periodically uh, adjust your... Uh, your probe because of micro micrometeorite impacts and stuff like that. So there are different source, sources of noise at different frequencies, just like the ground-based detectors. But the, the main source of noise actually at the higher frequencies is the photon shot noise that you may have heard of in, in, in an earlier lecture where we were talking about uh, the ground-based detectors as well. 
Um, right. So then, um, uh, something that uh, Cole already went over is, uh, well, having an estimate of the typical uh, strength of gravitational waves in terms of, uh, well, what the masses in the problem are and what, what the size uh, in the problem is, what the distance to the source is, and so on. And this is uh, more or less the formula that uh, he arrived at. Uh, I embellished it a little bit uh, to uh, um, show a little bit more of the physics that you arrive at by doing you know, uh, a more rigorous calculation. What Cole did was, was give a nice uh, um, back of the envelope calculation so that you can at least see, well, for instance, what kind of detector you would need to detect uh, gravitational waves of astrophysical nature in the first place. But in any case, um, the gravitational wave as measured uh, on Earth, well, first of all, it, it uh, includes this prefactor that I didn't write of g squared by c to the fourth, uh, because it's so scary, so I left it out. Um, so, but but we, we always have to remember that uh, it is there. But, you know, other than that, well, what, what, what determines the strength of gravitational waves? Well, one is the compactness, which is this second factor here the mass divided by the typical size, uh, size of the system. We, we want very compact systems. We want the mass overall to be high. This is somewhat like what I was saying earlier, right? Uh, why, why is it that uh, as you increase the mass, you can see further? Well, that is because intrinsically the gravitational wave signal will become stronger. Uh, there'll be this uh, inverse dependence on the distance. Um, there'll be a dependence on the asymmetry because, okay, to, get, to have gravitational radiation, you need a varying quadrupole moment, but to get a, you know, a, quadru a varying quadrupole moment also means that you have um, uh, asymmetry in the problem, and that is, this dimensional, that is what, what this dimensionless epsilon is meant to be. And, as you would expect, there will be some dependence on, on how dynamical the system is, how you know, high the velocities are, and so V would be the characteristic velocity, V by, v by CC is the speed of light to some power alpha, where alpha depends on the kind of system you're, you're looking at, whether it's a coalescing binary or maybe some uh, excited fluid mode in a neutron star or, or whatever there may be. So what is important is, well, we want very compact objects. We want objects that uh, are not too far away from us, although sometimes we have no choice in that matter. Uh, we want certainly things that move very fast and they need to be uh, asymmetric. Um, and so what kind of sources would fit that bill? Um, you already, I noticed, could give the answer when Cole uh, asked the question, so you already know this, but okay, uh, let's repeat once again. We, uh, I already mentioned, of course, the, the coalescing binary neutron stars and binary black holes. Uh, <coughs> those will be our sort of workhorse uh, sources in that we're fairly sure that before the end of the decade we will find a signal from those sources. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that there aren't uh, other sources around that uh, could give a detectable signal. Um, in, in this, uh, if you consider this a table, then this column here corresponds to short duration signals. Because coalescing binaries, well, we see them typically at the very end of their life when, you know, they're spiraling towards each other at a, an, an enormous rate and then they're merging and then maybe there's a ring down. Uh, with the exception, of course, of the white dwarf binaries that, you, that we may be able to see with the space-based detectors. But usually uh, these will be short duration sources. Although I should say that coalescing binaries, in the case of, of LISA, are not so short duration. They can take they can be in band for an entire year, okay? So what short duration means really depends on uh, what detector we consider. But uh, as I said, in most of these lectures, I'm going to implicitly assume that we're talking in the context of the second generation detectors. Advanced LIGO, Advanced Virgo, LIGO India, CAGRA. Um, so, okay, we have our coalescing binaries. Then another kind of short duration transient source are the so-called burst sources. And as we'll see in a minute, bursts is really, uh, a kind of basket that you throw everything in that is not uh, a coalescing binary. And in some cases, you throw in somewhat unusual coalescing binaries even. And I'll explain in a minute why we do this. It is, it, it is related to the fact that for these kinds of transients, you need different te techniques to search for the signal than uh, in the case of the coalescing binaries, because in the case of the coalescing binaries, you actually know pretty well what uh, the, 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 the signal looks like, what the, form, what the waveform is. So an example of the bursts are, uh, for instance, uh, uh, supernovae, if they happen in the galaxy, that is, if they are close enough. Uh, but there's a whole range of other burst sources that uh, I'll come to in a minute. 
So that, that's the transients column then, this left column. And then the right column is the column with the very long duration sources. So you have fast spinning neutron stars with a little mountain on them. Uh, that is a long duration source because, well, these things can keep spinning for thousands of years. So what limits you is really your total observation time, how long you're uh, willing to keep your instrument switched on. Um, uh, and then I should say that uh, um, you can get signals from uh, objects like also when they are in a binary, but in this case in a binary with a normal star, a large normal star that might be accreting matter onto your neutron star and enhancing its asymmetry, which is an important thing we need to have for uh, powerful gravitational wave emission. So that's the fast spinning neutron stars. And then you have the so-called stochastic gravitational waves. Um, we hope that we will be able to see something of a fundamental nature, that is something coming out of the extremely early universe, like uh, uh, possibilities include a signal not from inflation itself, that would be too, too low frequency, but maybe a signal from the termination of the inflation process. Uh, that would be extremely exciting because, um, well, I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, uh, uh, other possibilities are phase, phase transitions in the very early universe. Um, uh, Cole also mentioned cosmic strings. If you, have an, uh, uh, you know, if you have cosmic string signals coming from basically all over the sky, then uh, you, you, have, you can have a large number of unresolvable sources, not individually resolvable, but you, you can still see the collective uh, background that they create. Um, and also there will be astro other, astro more likely actually, astrophysical backgrounds, such as backgrounds from coalescing binaries again, but out to such large dif distances that you can't see them as, in as individual sources because you're, they, they wouldn't be loud enough, your signal-to-noise ratio is not high enough, you wouldn't be confident enough that you see the individual sources. But you could, again, see the collective radiation created by these, sto these sources as a stochastic background. Okay, so I'm, I'm way uh, behind time, but that's okay. Um, uh, there were excellent questions, in fact, so that's, that's good. Uh, so now let me go through these different kinds of sources one by one. Uh, so the coalescence of compact binaries, probably you, you've seen a picture like this already. So what, what happens typically is um, uh, first they are, they are very far apart in uh, uh, typically eccentric orbits. And then gravitational waves will do, will do two things. Uh, they will take away orbital kinetic energy, so the orbit shrink. It will also take away orbital angular momentum, so the orb and the orbits are, are going to circle, right? And for ground-based second-generation detectors, by the time the signal enters the band, the binary will be undergoing quasi-circular motion. But the two objects are spiraling towards each other, of course. So, uh, uh, and then below you see the cartoon picture of uh, the signal. So the amplitude increases and then the frequency increases monotonically. And then some last stable orbit is, is reached, the two objects uh, plunge towards each other and merge to form a single black hole, which will be highly asymmetric and it will want to shed its asymmetry um, uh, 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 to then evolve towards a quiescent Kerr black hole. And uh, the shedding of the asymmetry uh, we call the ring down process and that is this part of the waveform. Now, uh, so the first problem is to detect and then to extract science, right? right? So how are, uh, how are we going to uh, detect signals um, in a lot of noise? Because the second generation detectors will also be extremely noisy. Well, in a lot of noise, you will have to search for a signal like this that is determined by at least 15 parameters. There are, two, there are the two masses, there are the two spins. Each of the two spins are vectors. So together there are six degrees of freedom, right? Uh, two times uh, a three vector. There's the distance, the position on the sky, the orientation of the binary, maybe at some reference time in case there's precession, and then the time and phase at, uh, the arri at arrival. Now, if we had to search over such a high dimensional um, parameter space, we would be in a lot of trouble. But fortunately, we don't have to, and there is such a, a thing called matched filtering uh, that helps us a great deal. So first of all, the general idea of matched filtering um, and I, here too I'll, I'll get into more detail later on, but the general idea is that basically you take your uh, detector output, your data stream, and you uh, integrate it against a trial waveform. Remember in the case of coalescing binaries, you know more or less what, a wave, what at least what the family of waveforms look like, and you weight that by, your, by the sensitivity of your detector. Why? Because you want to 
to give more weight to the integral where the detector is more sensitive and less weight to the integral where the detector is less sensitive because where it is less sensitive you're going to be integrating garbage right you, you don't have much uh, um, yeah, sensitivity there <laughs> so that is that is why we do that and the nice thing is that um, you um, well, you have to p make different choices, you know, for the different waveforms you're going to match against the data because, you know, different masses means a different uh, frequency evolution and so on. But the nice thing is, in this case, that the extrinsic parameters that at first instance you don't care, much, care about so much, like sky position, orientation and distance, can be absorbed into an overall amplitude. And you don't have to separately search over them, and so you get a far smaller dimensional parameter space than, you ha than that 15 dimensional one you had before. Um, so you do that, you fold in the known properties of the noise, that's exactly what I already uh, uh, mentioned here. And so uh, you integrate and you get a single number which is called the signal to noise ratio. And if the signal to noise ratio is high, that means you have a waveform that has an excellent fit with some signal that is uh, in the data and, and you can be fairly confident that actually in the first place there is a signal in the data. So uh, that is a signal-to-noise ratio. And then, like I said, uh, different masses still, of course, cause uh, different frequency evolutions and therefore, you know, qualitatively uh, different waveforms. And so you need to uh, repeat this calculation of a signal-to-noise ratio for a large number of mass choices. And where applicable, also choices of spins. Uh, in the case of neutron stars, you can get away with not even uh, including spins in the analysis because you might expect that in the case, case of binary neutron stars, they are small. But in the case of binary black holes, that is probably a, a, an extremely bad assumption. But in any case, you do this for a, a large number of mass and possibly uh, spin choices. And then uh, that, that, that means uh, you, can, you, you construct a template bank that is in the space of mass 1, mass 2. You pick uh, certain locations where you're going to generate a waveform that you're going to match against your data. And you see that uh, this is an actual example of such a template bank. You see that the density of templates in parameter space is, is not the same everywhere. Uh, the reason is that, for instance, at very low masses, the, s the part of the signal in band will have many, many cycles. Okay? Now, that means that if you change the masses a little bit, the number of cycles will change. And if you see many, many cycles, then in the end, your you know, template waveform will get out of phase with a signal that might be in the data. So that means that here, in this part of the mass plane, you have to pack your templates more densely than uh, at the, the higher mass end. So, but then we're not done yet. So now we, yeah. So this mass plane basically depends on the intrinsic yeah, m mostly, yes, actually entirely on the intrinsic uh, parameters and the extrinsic parameters can be absorbed into an overall amplitude that sets the loudness of the signal, let's say. Do we know all the parameters because the actual gravitational force may have some unknown parameters? Well, actually, in, when I said 15 parameters, one thing that I didn't include was the possibility of eccentricity. Another thing that I didn't include was the, the possibility that for whatever reason, uh, neutron stars are, are much more deformable than we thought, and you know uh, uh, that deform deformation might have a significant uh, influence on the signal, and that too are, we are not taking uh, into account, even though those two are uh, intrinsic parameters of the system. Yeah. But How yes. So how, how, what density to, to pick? I'll actually get to that in, in I think, the next lecture. So the, it, it has a very detailed answer, and, and I'll give you the detailed uh, explanation. Yeah. Okay. So now we, we know how to calculate uh, a signal-to-noise ratio, which, very roughly speaking, is a number that gives, gives us that there is a signal uh, in the data. But that is not enough, because um, our detectors are imperfect, um, and uh, there will be instrumental glitches. There, there will be times at which the instrument is misbehaving and not, not always in a way that can, uh, that can be understood and sometimes not even in a way that we will notice very well. Okay? Uh, so there will be glitchiness in the data and sometimes it will happen that uh, the data actually, by happenstance, 
mimics something like an inspiral. And you know, you want to uh, uh, be very careful then uh, with declaring a detection, knowing that uh, this sort of thing goes on in the detector. So we uh, uh, want a number of checks that we call signal consistency checks. That is, is what we see in the detector really consistent with the signal? Uh, and uh, um, so, well, uh, what can you do? Well, um, first of all, uh, you, you check for consistency. Well, first, the zeroth order thing is actually that you want to see a signal more or less at this, or a potential signal more or less at the same time in multiple detectors. That's, the zeroth, that's going to be the zeroth order requirement to see it in two detectors. And maybe you'll miss it in a third one because it has somewhat lower sensitivity at that time. Um, but then even then, if, even if you see a signal in two different uh, detectors, you want what we call co coincidence, not only in time, so they have, the signal has to be seen at approximately the same time, of course taking into account the, the light travel time between detectors, but also it, uh, the, you know, the uh, template that gives the, the template waveform that gives the highest signal to noise ratio, in both cases they should have similar intrinsic parameter values, similar masses. So that is one thing. But that is not enough even to uh, uh, prevent us from uh, making false uh, detection claims. Uh, what we also want to do is um, take our data streams and slide them on a computer, of course, slide them with respect to each other in time by uh, some number, some large multiple of the light travel time between detectors. And then we again do an analysis and see if we can find uh, coincidence signals between the two data streams. Um, and so, you know, uh, consistent between detectors um, in time and in parameter space, except if you do this with data streams that have been time slit with, with respect to, to each other, then all of the candidate detections you find are false, right? Because they, they uh, are not, uh, they didn't really, even if they were real signals, they di didn't really arrive at the same uh, time in wall clock time, in real time, that is. Um, and so when we do that, we arrive at what is called a background distribution of spurious events. So basically, uh, what, what is the distribution of signal-to-noise ratio, given that uh, there's these many glitches um, in the data? Um, but then, uh, ah, yes, uh, something that fell off this slide, I guess. Another thing that we uh, want to do is um, a slightly more clever kind of signal consistency test Namely, is the, the buildup of signal-to-noise ratio over di different frequency brin bins consistent with there being, for instance, an in-spiral. And that is what uh, this poorly visible plot, unfortunately, is supposed to suggest. And that is what we call a chi-square test. So basically what you do is you, you take your frequency range and you divide it into frequency bins of unequal width, but such that there is equal contribution to the SNR coming from each of the bins, if it is a true signal, right? And so that is an important test you also do, and that is what we call a chi-square test. And so the genuine events or simulated uh, uh, signals can be uh, uh, separated from this background of spurious events based on signal-to-noise ratio and chi-square. <coughs> So, and that is what is plotted here. So on the x-axis, I have signal-to-noise ratio. On the y-axis, I have this chi-square test, the signal consistency test with the different frequency bins, and so on. And if an, so what happens is, well, the, the black crosses here are spurious events. They're not gravitational wave events. They come from, these, from this time slide idea. And then the, the, the red crosses here are real events, or rather they are simulated signals th that are very realistic and were artificially put in the data. And you see that there is good separation. In particular, you see that for a given signal-to-noise ratio, a spurious event will have a larger chi-squared. Uh, that, that too, but they are actually due to non-stationarity. So, you know, it could have been that the, the, the noise was Gaussian, but always the same. That is, you know, always coming from the same fixed 
distribution, which however could have been non-Gaussian. That would not have been such a problem even. But it, it is the non-stationarities, so the, the, the fact that you have these sudden glitches, uh, that, that is what, what, what does it. And this, this could indeed also have a, a, an origin extraneous to the detector, like an airplane flying down. How well these noises, like seismic and these urban noise, could be approximated to this uh, oh, so, well, um, you know, in constructing or in predicting what your noise curve is more or less going to look like, um, you, that can be reasonably mo modeled theoretically. What, so, and that is not what I'm talking about here. That is not what is, ca what is causing the spurious events. What is causing the spurious events is that this nice smooth noise curve, well, in, e in every frequency bin, it, it jitters all the time. It, it dances up and down all the time. And so that is, that is more the, the effect that causes these uh, events that might look like in spirals, but actually aren't. OK, uh, first there and then there. Yeah? Sir, how do you interpret this chi-squared? Sorry? How do you interpret this chi-squared versus chi-squared? Oh, well, the chi-squared is a sum over. So I mentioned you, um, you uh, um, so basically what you do is in the frequency domain uh, between some lower frequency and some uh, upper frequency, you divide your frequency domain into bins of different size, but in such a way that if there is, uh, in, but in such a way that if there is a real signal with the masses corresponding to the uh, template that gave SNR in one of the detection detectors, for instance, in such a way that there's equal contribution to the SNR in each bin. So I'm, I'm going to call that, that fixed number delta SNR. So there's the amount of SNR contributed by the first frequency bin is delta SNR. The amount of SNR contributed by second bin is also the same number, and so on, if there is a real signal. Then you take your data stream as a function of time minus that template that uh, gave you the highest signal to noise ratio and actually make it a function of frequency we, we can take uh, Fourier transforms and divide that up uh, uh, and, and look at you know uh, uh, what this becomes in different bins right then I can put an I underneath so basically what this would be is this the sum over all the frequency bins of this different squared Sorry? That, and that is chi-squared, yeah. And so you can see that, you know, if what is in the data is actually not, not at all distributed over frequency as a signal, then this number is going to be large. At least some of the frequency bins are going to have a large contribution to the chi-squared. Don't you put some variance in the denominator? Sorry? Don't you put some variance in the denominator? Because chi-squared is the sum is sort of standard normal. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what I write, the formula I write here is a cartoon picture. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, when you talk of consistency between detectors, it should be in time, it should be in parameter space. Yeah. Because parameter space is huge, right? Yeah. And there could be degeneracy. Yes. Can you redefine because these are coincidence? So, this is the binary with the neutron stars. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, well, in the case of uh, binary neutron stars, if you assume that there are no spins, then there's only the two masses, so it's not, the degeneracies won't be so bad. But indeed, already, if you introduce spins, then uh, you will have a degeneracy, um, in particular between masses. Uh, sorry, in particular, you get a degeneracy between the size of the spins and the ratio of the masses. That's something you won't be able to figure out straight away, but you can see it from, sorry? Yeah, if you're looking for things that where you expect spin to be there in reality, then of course you have to uh, take it into account in your templates. And yes, you will get degeneracies, and that's actually a good point. And that is why you have to be careful with demanding consistency in parameter space, because it could be that, um, uh, well, uh, so there's, there's two problems, right? There, there's a degeneracy between spins and masses, if both are expected to be present. And there's also the different noise realizations in the different detectors, which, we, which can push the templates you know, away from each other in parameter space in the two detectors, that is, the, the templates that gave the highest SNR. And so you have to allow for some uncertainty in this whole process, uncertainty in the mass in each of the detectors. And we do that too.
Sorry? How the price bar would be distributed for real signals? For real signals, uh, it, it would be, well, like this distribution. Here, of course, the, 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 these are only simulated signals that were artificially added to the noise, but uh, that's, that's the best we can do. How the distribution of chi square for real events? It will be chi square. Yeah. Sorry. The what, what is the distribution of this calculated value of chi square? If the events were there. It, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it is a chi-square distribution, oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> it is a real chi-square. It is not quite what I wrote down here, of course. Uh, otherwise, you'd be able to see it more easily. So how do you practically choose the chi-square threshold? Oh, this, this, this is done actually more or less by hand. So basically, uh, you, you make a plot like this. Then you look at where your simulated events land. You look at, by doing the time slides, uh, where your spurious events lie and then you separate you try to come up with some curve in this rho chi squared uh, plane that separates the two of course this is something you know what 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 curve you're going to end up with is going to very much be dependent on what kind of detector what you have uh, the quality of the data the particular uh, non kinds of non-stationarities there are in the detector so it, 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 it is a bit of an art. It is not a, uh, an exact science. Okay. Generally, these things are done by assuming stationary mass, right? These simulations? No. The, uh, well, the calculation of the SNR is done assuming stationary noise over the duration of the signal. However, the, uh, this, this noise curve, this power spectral density that we divide by in our signal-to-noise integrand, that is something you can measure from the detector noise by looking, for instance, at stretches of noise just before or just after a place where you expect a signal uh, to be. So you estimate, basically, but that at least can be considered fairly accurate because it's, you know, the detector doesn't, uh, so the, the, the basic shape of this curve doesn't vary that quickly over time. However, glitches can be very short duration, and that is what causes then uh, uh, these spurious events. Okay, right. So, uh, well, and all this then together uh, will allow you, I won't go into that much detail, but will allow you to assign a false alarm probability to events. Um, I'm actually out of time and I have uh, a lot, um, well, a lot more to talk about. Sorry? Oh, we, we have time until one? Yeah. Okay, fine. Then we go to one. Okay, so, um, right. So now I've given you a very coarse overview of what is done because uh, there's a, there is a little bit more uh, to it than this, of course. But now uh, uh, to, to uh, finish up the detection effort, so uh, I'll, I'll just mention that there are qualitatively different kinds of searches we do depending on what the goal of the search is. Well, the goal is always detection, clearly. <laughs> but um, uh, for instance, uh, one thing we want to do is do detection in low latency. Low latency uh, means what it, what, what it states. It means that uh, in a very short time, you want to at least have some assessment of whether at a particular time, yeah, Sorry? What is the all time? Sorry? Uh, oh, all, all time, all, all sky, all time? You, you oh, yeah, yeah. So that is to distinguish it <coughs> from uh, searches around particular times that, that I'll get to. Actually, let me talk about that first. So there are, there, there are searches that we do around particular times and no others because uh, short, ham like I said before, short hard gamma ray bursts are believed to be caused by either binary neutron star coalescence or neutron star black hole. So <coughs> when the people with the gamma ray, uh, the gamma ray uh, satellites, when uh, they say, you know, on that day, uh, on, on such, at such and such a, such a time, we, we saw a short hard gamma ray burst, then of course we, 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 we are going to focus on that time and dig very deep into, into the data. So that is one kind of search, and we call them triggered searches because, well, the GRB is the trigger, basically. The all-sky, all-time searches, on the other hand, are, you know, where, where, where you look all the time, you, you analyze all of the times, and also you, you don't care where in the sky uh, the signal might have come from because a priori you don't know. With gamma ray bursts, often you, you have some position on the sky as well as the time. 
So, but in the all sky all time searches, you, have, you can assume no such thing. And you have to be as general as possible. So then, even the all sky all time searches are divided into two kinds. So you have the low latency searches where we try to get triggers, I'm not going to call them detections, you get triggers to electromagnetic astronomers in the order of a minute, let's say. So that they can, and also you construct a crude sky map from your detector network, because for instance, you know, uh, if you have detectors that are widely spaced on the Earth, then the signal will first hit one detector, then the next one, and then the next one. So just these th different times of arrival already allow you to triangulate. Also, the uh, different phases with which the signal arrives in the three detectors can be folded in, and you can arrive at a very crude sky map, and they, they will be crude. So here's an example. This is the entire sky. Uh, the star is where the event actually was, and this uh, stripe here is sort of like an uh, elongated sky error box that will be, you know, initially at least the best that we can give to the astronomy partners. Nevertheless, they are extremely interested in uh, uh, having our, our triggers, um, in the hope that, uh, well, they, that they will be searching such a large uh, sky error box and then they, they will uh, hope to find an electromagnetic counterpart. And then, of course, well, if you see the same object, not just in two different frequencies, but with two totally different fields, the gravitational field and the electromagnetic field, you can hope to learn a lot, a lot more. But that means that, you know, for the especially optical astronomers, for them to have a chance to see an optical counterpart, we have to be fast. They have to have that information really, really, really quickly because then, then the thing is going to fade again and they won't see anything. So that means that in, uh, in the low latency searches, we relax a lot of our ordinary requirements. And in particular, uh, you know, we will still give them a false alarm probability, but they should expect a large error on, the large, uh, a large error on that number for the false alarm probability that we will give them. And they know this, fortunately, or I hope they do. <laughs> we've, we've told it to them 20 times already. But they are e extremely excited about this. I mean, there are 60 plus groups that have signed up to uh, try and do this uh, in all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, from the optical uh, into, um, so from radio actually, uh, uh, up to higher and higher fre frequencies, optical, ultraviolet, uh, X-ray, and gamma. Um, so that is, so th those are the low latency searches. And then, you know, uh, th so again, the, the triggers we send out here, we cannot call detections, right? Because they, we, we don't even know for sure what the false alarm probability is. Um, but regardless of w whether or not astronomers also see something, we will do the high latency searches. So there we, we, we wait until we have an entire data set of three months long or six months long. Um, this will allow us to characterize, characterize that data set, which is the same as characterizing the instrument way better. Uh, for instance, times can, can then be, well, okay, let me not go into too much detail, but uh, the bottom line is you get a better estimate of the significance of candidate events. So, you know, if uh, it could be that a trigger we gave to the EM astronomers initially had a false alarm probability of, I don't know, one in a year, which is, you know, that's not impressive. But Again, there could be a large error on the false alarm, alarm probabilities we give them initially, and it could be that such an event will get promoted to a false alarm probability of one in 20 million years. And then we say, we have a detection, we publish. Okay. Uh, right. So then, detection is one thing, but like I said, uh, there will be two components to this course, and uh, there will be strong emphasis, actually, on what science you can extract once the detection has been made. And so um, after a confident detection, what are we going to do? Well, we will want to reconstruct the source. So that means at first instance, we want to measure masses, spins, distance, the sky location, orientation, uh, all those 15 parameters that you know, are now going to be a bit of a problem. Right, because uh, I said that in the detection effort, you don't have to separately search over 15 parameters because all the extrinsic parameters can be absorbed into some overall amplitude of the signal. But here you want all the information that is available in the signal. You want to extract it. So we need now techniques to explore a 15-dimensional parameter space and then find the most likely values of, uh, the, uh, of all those 15 parameters. And maybe even more. Like I said, if you introduce eccentricity, you, you get even more. Um, and there are various methods of doing that. 
one that uh, will have uh, a couple of lectures uh, devoted to it actually is called nested sampling and I don't have I mean I'm, I'm not going to go into detail here because again we'll get back to that in a major way but nested sampling means you take your huge dimensional uh, parameter space and you identify um, hyper hyper surfaces in that parameter space um, that are you know nested inside each other and that are guaranteed to converge to the place where the likelihood to some patch in the this huge dimensional parameter space where the likelihood is the the highest now of course how you pick those those uh, hyper sur surfaces and how you ensure that you know uh, the nesting of the hyper surfaces happens fast enough so that it becomes feasible um, well that will require some thinking but that is something uh, we will we will certainly get back to and so then that is a way to arrive at probability distributions for the parameters like here's a probability you can't read it probably here's a probability distribution for component mass one and for component mass two with some uncertainty um, here is the same thing but now uh, we have uh, yeah now we have mass one and mass two and then this uh, dark region here is where the uh, probability uh, distribution has most of its support and you see that there is degeneracy which was brought up earlier um, this probability distribution is stretched along what looks like a line but is actually a curve and it is actually a curve of constant chirp mass chirp mass is this particular combination of masses we can measure extremely well and the reason is that chirp mass is the dominant mass contribution both in the amplitude and in the phase so that we can measure pretty well and so that is what accounts for this uh, stretching here but or rather that acc that accounts for the fact that in this direction uh, you have a very thin support for your posterior density but in the other direction that is the direction of mass ratio and mass ratio appears at higher orders both in the amplitude and in the phase it, it uh, appears at higher post newtonian orders and is therefore less well measurable and so these, these uh, uh, degeneracies are under control, or at least, you know, we, we know of them, uh, and uh, we won't be fooled by them. There are other degeneracies, like between uh, the, the distance and the inclination of the orbital plane, because, you know, you could have uh, a face on binary, uh, which is very far away, giving approximately as loud a signal as an, as an edge on binary that's much closer by. So that's, again, a, a degeneracy you should expect. This is realistic, okay. yes, absolutely. Okay. So this, this comes from a signal that was, well, a simulated signal that was put in actual detector noise mm -hmm. and, and we release our parameter estimation algorithm on it. And what was the immediate listener? Oh, in this case, uh, I don't have it anywhere yeah. here, okay. but, for, but, but this, to me, the spreads of the masses suggest that it was not far from threshold. So I'm gonna say 15, but you know, don't pin me down. It's not 100. Uh, mm, well, uh, not without more information, not, wi not without more information. Um, there are claims which we discussed yesterday actually that maybe precession, spin precession could uh, help you pin down the, the, the masses further, but I would rather not commit to a statement uh, since uh, we didn't seem to totally agree yesterday. So. No, so, so, th so this parameter space here, you, this box here, you have to imagine that actually it has 15 axes. And then, uh, uh, so it's 15 dimensional, and then these, what, what, what you see as contours here are four, 14 dimensional uh, hypersurfaces. So he's asking whether these hypersurfaces can be parameterized by a single parameter, like some confidence level or something like that. Yes, they, are, they, they actually are um, surfaces of constant likelihood, yes. Okay, right. So, and then, uh, well, we, we're not only interested in just measuring parameters because, you know, uh, if a certain black hole binary has, has, happens to have component masses of 8 and 15, by itself that's not so interesting. Uh, the scientific payoff will be, for instance, if you see a large number of different signals, uh, can we maybe extract something like the distribution of the masses and the spins for binary black holes? 
Uh, can we measure the equation of state of neutron stars, which was already mentioned earlier, how deformable neutron stars are as an influence on uh, the way they spiral towards each other. It will also have uh, uh, an influence on, on what the merger looks like, and that is something we are interested in. Um, then tests of the, uh, the truly strong field dynamics of general relativity uh, that can only be done by looking at binaries. That too is something I'll discuss in great detail later on. And then cosmology without a cosmic distance ladder, I'll also get to that. Okay. So the first thing you can ask once you have, you have seen a, 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 a compact binary coalescence is, is general relativity right? Um, so, okay, then we look at our in-spiral merger ring down regime. Well, the in-spiral regime is very well understood in terms of this post-Newtonian approximation that you've had uh, lectures about. Uh, then increasingly, the part just before the merger is uh, there we have increasing analytic insight even with uh, input uh, from, uh, but there's also input from numerical simulations. And then again, the ring down signal is uh, pretty well understood in terms of perturbation theory. Now, um, now all, so almost all te uh, existing tests of general relativity either involve small space-time curvature or the dynamics of space-time is not so important. And, you know, there is no test where both the space-time curvature is strong and the dynamics are very important. But that is, of course, the most interesting regime of general relativity there is, right? Um, uh, in any field theory, especially a highly nonlinear field theory, you want to know, uh, you know, is the dynamics correct and how does the self-interaction uh, work? And, in fact, we'll see later on that one thing you can only uh, look at with uh, compact binary coalescence is the dynamical self-interaction of space-time. Um, there'll be an entire lecture devoted to this, so again here I will not go into uh, gruesome detail, but we can make a comparison between, you know, uh, electromagnetic observations of binary neutron stars, which already allow for a, a much better test of GR than any that, that have been uh, conducted before, compare that with what we could do with our compact binary, uh, in, uh, with, with our compact binary coalescences. Now, um, the EM observations of binary neutron stars mostly give you weak field tests. What I wrote here is the compactness, um, which is order 10 to the minus 6. So M is the total mass of the binary, R is the separation between the two pulsars. So order 10 to the minus 6. Uh, for comparison, uh, at the surface of the sun, the surface gravity of the sun is also 10 to the minus 6, so that's not much. Um, and also, these binary neutron stars that we now already observe are not very relativistic with V by C's order 10 to the minus 3. Again, for comparison, the uh, velocity of Mercury as it goes around the Sun is a few times 10 to the minus 4 in V by C. Whereas by, with compact binary coalescence, we'll get compactnesses greater than 0.2 and V by C's greater than 0.5. Oh, the, these are pretty uh, generic. So, uh, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> um, so V by C of 0 0.4 is the, v, is the V by C at last stable orbit. And we will see more than that because we'll see the merger as well for the more massive systems. And then uh, the, uh, the compactness that I quote here is also the compactness at LSO. At LSO. But that will again increase as you uh, go towards the merger still. <coughs> So now, again, I'm going to go into way more detail later on, but what I plotted here is uh, post-Newtonian order probed by some experiment, some test, and magnitude of GR violation that you would be able to see. Now, the red region here is the region in terms of post-Newtonian order and strength of possible violations that is already excluded. That is, you know, in this red region here, you shouldn't expect any more GR violations. It's been, it's been checked. Then the dots here, the blue dots, is depending on uh, powers of V by C beyond leading order, or depending on PN order in the phase, actually, is how, f how deep we will be ob able to probe with binary neutron star coalescence. And you see that, for instance, the 1.5 PN coefficient in the phase is what this is, actually, will be probed with binary neutron stars with, uh, uh, with uh, an accuracy that is way better than what we can do with binary pulsars. With binary pulsars, the bound is basically this line which you can continue forever, right? And you're on a logarithmic scale here. 
So if you were to continue the, this, the edge of the red region here, you would see that this dot is six orders of magnitude uh, below the existing bound from this binary <coughs> pulsar, which is almost the same as saying that at 1.5 1, 1 post-Newtonian order, the binary pulsar gives you no bound at all, it, or nothing interesting. And even at lower post-Newtonian orders, you get no interesting bound from any existing uh, uh, observation. For that, you need direct detection of gravitational waves. And so you see, okay, this is 1.5 pn, this is 2 pn, this is uh, um, 3 pn, and th all this is bi with binary neutron stars. Here, here we already have a very solid test of general relativity that we could already apply to the first detection when it comes. Then for binary black holes, we can only make estimates of how deep we will be able to probe because the waveforms, the waveform models we would use for high accuracy tests of GR in the binary black hole case are not quite available yet, although people are getting there. So yes. What's the y-axis? Um, the y-axis, well, since you asked. <laughs> so the, the y-axis is the following. Suppose you, uh, suppose you write, uh, there must be longer chalk somewhere. So suppose you focus on the, the post-Newtonian phase, right? So psi as a function of f or as a function of uh, velocity or whatever, then roughly speaking, what you do is, you will, this is the GR prediction, let's say. What you do is you replace this by the GR prediction again plus something, some, something that looks like some beta times v to the power b, okay? And so what is shown here is on the, on the x-axis, where was it again? Well, anyway. Uh, so what is shown here on the x-axis is essentially this um, coefficient, uh, this power little b here, what is on the y-axis is beta. And then you can ask, you know, how, how large, for a given b, that is for a given post-Newtonian order, how large can beta be so that the binary pulsars would have picked it up? That is what gives you this, this bound. And then you can ask, um, how for a give, again, for a given p and order, how large does beta need to be so that we will pick it up? And that's a much smaller number. So that is, that is what is plotted here. Yes? So uh, for what kind of binary? With a neutron star black hole binary? No, it's a radio pulsar black hole binary. Oh, uh, well, it depends on how tight it is, first of all, right? Because here, here we are looking uh, explicitly at the dissipative dynamics, right? So at, at, the, at the gravitational wave emission. So the answer would be how tight is the binary? Sorry? Wouldn't you have some separation to get the curvy pairs for using the same separation package? Ah, so if you use the same separation that you assume for your current binary pulsar yes. data, to replace one pulsar with a black hole. With a black hole. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes. So th okay. Then I, th I can only make a qualitative statement. I expect this uh, uh, edge to come down by how much? Uh, let's do the calculation. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, um, I know this plot is kind of confusing at first because you have on the one hand a region, and on the other hand you have just dots, right? So the plot is as follows. So we take our phase from GR, um, and we add to this a possible violation that looks like this. It looks like beta times v over c to some power little b. And actually, the reason for picking this is because uh, most alternative theories of gravity to leading order do manifest themselves like this. So it's not a bad choice. Um, now then, for a given b, b is on the x-axis. For a given b, you can ask, how large does beta have to be so that the binary pulsar picks up the GR violation? Well, that is, that is this, this curve here, okay? And then similarly, you can ask, well, for, with compact binary coalescence direct, directly detected uh, with advanced detectors, uh, again, for a given b, how large does beta need to be so that we pick it up? And here we only have results for certain pn orders so far, and those are these dots. For instance, at 1.5 pn, 
you can read off how large beta has to be uh, so that we can start picking it up. And you see that, well, we, we do much better kind of as, as expected because our systems get way more compact and they get way more dynamical in terms of V by C. Yes, that's exactly right, yeah. For that order in V by C. Yeah. Okay, uh, right. Oh, yeah, this was the one. Good. Um, so that is one thing we want to do with uh, compact binary coalescence. Uh, I'm approaching the one o'clock, but uh, let me actually, I'm, what I'm going to do is the following. So uh, since this lecture was sufficiently general that there's no tutorial to go with it yet, there will be four more tutorials after that starting tomorrow. What I propose is that uh, we stop at one o'clock here and then the tutorial can be the rest of the lecture. Is that agreeable to, to everybody? Okay. Uh, okay. So then uh, what I'm going to do now is simply uh, finish what you might be able to do with uh, compact binary coalescence in, in scientific terms. Well, actually, you know, I might as well stop here because it is so close to one o'clock. We can pick this up later. We have time. <laughs>